Father, as we come before you this morning, we do so with a sense of 
gratitude, with a sense of thanksgiving, with a sense of anticipation, wondering what you may do. Lord, we pray that as we come into your presence that we would do so with a spirit of expectation, longing that your Spirit may move amongst us, that you may move powerfully, that the wind of the Spirit may blow in through this place, through the hearts and lives of all those who are gathered. For we know, Lord God, that there are those here this morning who know and who love you. There are those here this morning who are confused and who are perhaps skeptical, those who are doubting, those who are questioning. But we also know, Lord God, that there are those here this morning whose hearts are hard, whose hearts are hardening uh, towards you and towards your word. And so, Father, we pray that your Spirit might move in power and that you might draw people to yourself inextricably so, uh, that the draw would be irresistible, uh, that you would bring people to a, a knowledge of self and the brokenness of the human spirit and to a knowledge of the wonder-working power of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has come, the one who has lived, the one who has died, the one who has offered his life as a ransom for many, the one who has been resurrected, the one who has ascended, the one who is seated at your right hand in the throne room of heaven, even now living to intercede, to pray on behalf of his people, to be our representative, our advocate in the throne room of heaven. Lord God, we pray that your Spirit may come. Lord, we thank you that as we worship you this morning, we worship a God who is sovereign over all, that you know each and everything, that you are involved in every aspect of life, that there is nothing that surprises you or uh, perturbs you, but that you use all means and every providence for your good and for, uh, for our good and for your glory. And so, Lord, we pray that you would continue to work in the broken hearts and lives that are set before you. Lord, that we would recognize our own frailty and our weakness, that we would come before you in meekness and humility with a contrite heart, repentant of our sin and seeking the goodness of the Lord in our lives. Father, we pray that you would shine your light into the dark recesses of our hearts, into the places where we have compartmentalized sin, into places where we have uh, sought to justify action which is at odds with your word and with your will. And Lord, we pray that you would shine the light of the gospel there, that we would be able to confess and repent and move on and to become new creations, the continued transformation of sanctification within our lives and our experiences. Lord, we pray that you would unite your people here in this place to be a great force for good and for the gospel cause here in Loch Broom and in Koigach. Lord, we pray for those in our communities, in the villages that surround us who have little thought or interest in the things of God, and yet who are uh, continuing headlong into a lost eternity. Lord, may you give us a sense of urgency. May you give us the unction of the Holy Spirit to go and to, to love and to care for and to point those who are lost to Jesus. For if we do not go, who will tell them? And if we not, do not tell them, how will they hear? And if we do not speak the gospel, they will never hear it. So, Father, we pray that you would use us as your agents, as your heralds, that we may testify to the grace, that the, the grace of the gospel may be received, the, the grace of the gospel may transform lives, and that those who are transformed would become transformers, that those who have received would become transmitters, just as we considered on Wednesday evening. Lord, we pray for the world in which we live and the brokenness that is played out on the world stage across the globe. Lord, we see man's inhumanity to man, Lord, we pray for your spirit and your spirit of peace and power to come. We pray for peace in the Middle East. We pray for uh, a ceasefire in, uh, between Russia and, and Ukraine. We pray for a removal of Russian troops from the ground. We pray for uh, civil unrest in so many countries. We pray for those who profess your name and who are persecuted and oppressed as a result of that. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would bring peace and power as only you can. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to read from John's Gospel in chapter 13 this morning. We're going to read the opening 17 verses, but our focus is going to be on just really the first five verses. We're going to take a wee bit of time uh, going through this chapter. That'll be of no surprise to you by now, I'm sure, as we go through the Gospel of John forensically. Uh, but there is just so much uh, within his Gospel for us to consider, and so much of such significance to us as he writes with the expressed desire that we might believe. That is the theme of our, our study is believe, a journey through John. 
uh, John's desire is that by reading his gospel, his account, his eyewitness testimony, that we might believe, believe in Jesus, and that by believing in him may have life in his name, life eternal. Uh, and as you know, if you've been with us, we are transitioned uh, last time from the public ministry of Jesus now into the private ministry of Jesus uh, with his disciples just in the run up to his arrest, his uh, false imprisonment and trial, and his, his death on the cross. This is a really significant part of the gospel narrative, the gospel story, and there is so much for us to consider and to learn from it. So, let's read from John's gospel, the living Word of God, and hear what it has to say to us. This is God's Word. It was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for Him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Amen. May the Lord bless our reading to us. Let's again just pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus, our Savior this morning, the one in whom we find life and redemption and reconciliation and forgiveness, the one in whom we have been ushered into your presence, the one through whom we have been offered a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his life and for his witness and for his ministry and for his example. We thank you for the extant record of that that we have set before us, that we might follow the example that he sets forth, that we may have the meekness that he had, strength under control, power harnessed, that we may have his humility, that we may have the servant's heart, that we may be willing to serve just as he served that we with him might be able to say, I have, not come, I have come not to be served, but to serve and give my life for others. And so, Lord, we pray that you would open your word to us afresh this morning. We pray that you would work in our hearts and our lives, hearts and lives that are complex, full of uncertainties, hearts and lives set before us today that are faced with huge personal difficulty and challenge. Uh, Lord, we give thanks that your grace is sufficient for all things and that you are able, and that you are the one who can meet us at every point of our need. And so we pray that we would surrender ourselves to you, coming to an end of our own resources, recognizing that we are weak and fallible, but that you, O oh Lord, are sovereign and powerful, that we have access through Jesus Christ to a, a, a limitless power, a power that is in, incomparable. And so, Lord, we pray that we would call upon your name, exercising this great privilege that is ours to come before you, in prayer, knowing that you hear and that you answer. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
sure those of you who are around in the 80s, like myself, will remember Shalimar. I'm going to make this a night to remember. Well, here we have in John chapter 13, a night that the disciples would certainly remember. I'm sure many of us have had experiences within our own lives where we've had nights that we still remember, days that are forever etched into our memories, things that will never, ever leave us, life-changing experiences, life-changing nights. Well, this night that Jesus eats this meal in the upper room with His disciples was a life-changing night. From this night forward, their lives would be different forever more. Indeed, every Passover meal, even to the present day, a child will ask the father at the Passover meal, what makes this night different from all of the other nights? That's a question that's written into the liturgy, as it were, of the Passover meal. And of course, the night is so significant because God thought it important enough that His people would remember forever what He had done for them in leading them out of captivity in Egypt, that they painted the lintels and doorposts of their houses with the the blood of the Lamb and the Spirit of the Lord passed over, and they were safe. They were delivered on that night and then delivered out of bondage, out of uh, captivity. And so, that meal, that meal represents an act of remembrance of the things that the Lord has done for the Lord's people, that they may never forget the power of God and what He has done for them. As the disciples gather here with Jesus, it's what's become known as the Last Supper. Um, The disciples had spent many nights with Jesus. They had had many meals with Jesus. They had shared previous Passovers, at least two of them, with Jesus. But this night, this meal was going to be different from every other one before. It was such an extraordinary night that John, the writer of this gospel, uh, views the night over a number of chapters. There is such significance to this period of time that John devotes chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and part of chapter 18 to this night. This is an unforgettable night. It is a night to remember. Now, in the course of this night to remember, one of the things that the Lord does, Jesus does, is give what's called the upper room discourse, and we're going to be discussing that in the coming weeks, God willing, Uh, as He gives us all of the information uh, that He gives to His disciples to empower them and to equip them for the life uh, and the work that lies ahead of them, which is very helpful yet for us even today. The truth is that in our own lives, we're going to have some special nights. We're going to have some special days. We're going to have some interesting encounters, and some of them may, may not even stand out as being particularly noteworthy. And yet, with hindsight, as we look back, we see certain events, certain circumstances that have become hinge events in our lives, key moments in our development as people, in our character, in our faith, in our family, etc. Five reasons this morning why this night was so special, why this night was so different to others, why this night was a night to remember. Number one, it was framed by a sense of timing. It was framed by a sense of timing. There are words in the text that indicate to us that it was a special time. It was the time of Passover. Passover was a special time for the Jewish people. They would gather together. If you lived anywhere within the vicinity of Jerusalem, then it was one of the three mandatory feasts that you had to attend in the city. And even if you lived further away, you would, even if you lived anywhere else in within traveling proximity, you would desire to be there. Uh, It was one of the high events. The the place was packed with people. Uh, Josephus, the historian, tells us that one Passover season uh, during this era, 256,000 lambs were slaughtered in the temple for the Passover meal. And the ratio, of course, was uh, one lamb to 10 people. So, you can imagine, do the math, 
I'm not a mathematician, I'm not great at maths, but I can do those, those maths. Think about how many people were celebrating the Passover in Jerusalem at that time. The lamb was slain, the lamb was then given to the family, to the group, they took it home, they roasted it, they had a leisurely meal together, they celebrated the moment in history that their people were delivered from captivity out of the, the bonds of bondage. But this night, this night was different to your run-of-the-mill uh, Passover meal for these disciples, because they weren't just celebrating the lamb that was killed in the temple. They weren't just celebrating the lamb that was killed thousands of years ago to paint the lintels and door frames of their houses that the angel of the Lord may pass over. They were celebrating something entirely different. They would come to discover, perhaps not right at that moment, but they're sitting there at the table, and they would be celebrating the Lamb who was in their midst, Jesus, who John the Baptist, you remember, called the Lamb of God, who comes to take away the sin of the world. But look at verse 1. There's something else about the timing. It was just before the Passover meal. Jesus knew that the hour had come for Him to leave this world and go to the Father. Now, through our study of John's gospel, we've become familiar with this term, my hour, or my time. Six times in the gospel this phrase comes up, and it's significant. John really hammers this theme throughout his gospel up until this point. The first time we encountered it was in chapter 2 at the marriage supper in Cana in Galilee. Remember, his mother suggests, Jesus' mother suggests, that he do something to introduce himself as the Messiah to the people, and he turned to her and he said, woman, my hour has not yet come chapter 7, chapter 8, Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's at the temple. Uh, he says he does some controversial things, as Jesus always does. They try to grab him, but the Word reminds us no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. John chapter 12, he's again in Jerusalem. He goes into the city on a donkey. It's Palm Sunday, and arriving in the temple, he says, the hour has come that the Son of Man is to be glorified. A few minutes later, he says, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, but for this very purpose I came to this hour. So, all the way through the gospel, Jesus, when we encounter Him, is speaking about time. He's speaking about His hour. He's speaking about His time. So, what makes this different to all of the other nights? What makes this different? this night. Well, this is a moment in history when Jesus recognizes that all of the things are coming together, all of the component parts, He recognizes that now His time has come, that this is when He is going to be offered up as a lamb, as a sacrifice for many. It's because of the significance of this that John devotes so many chapters to this single night. And he's not alone. There are 89 chapters in total in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. 85 of those 89 chapters focus on the last three and a half years of Jesus' life on earth. And of those 85 chapters, 29 of them focus on the final week of Jesus' life on earth, and 13 of them deal with the last 24 hours of His earthly life. It's such a focus, a significant focus. 579 separate verses in all four Gospels zero in on this hour, this moment in time, this 24-hour period where Jesus gives His life for the world. That's why writers uh, say things like, you cut the Bible anywhere and it bleeds. That's why we just sang about, there is a fountain filled with blood it is the blood of Jesus that brings about salvation, cleansing. It's, it's the, the blood of Jesus that is required without blood, without the shedding of blood. The, the Bible reminds us there is no remission of sins. That's why we focus on the cross. Not because we're morbid and Presbyterian and Highland. It's got nothing to do with that. It's because on the cross of Calvary, Jesus' blood was shed. The sinless, spotless Lamb of God gave His life and shed His blood that He may atone for the sin of the world, for your sin and for my sin. That's why we call it Good Friday and say, it doesn't sound very good. Well, it, it wasn't good. It was great, in fact, because here is 
God the Son, the second member of the Trinity, giving His life in this hour in order that you and I may live eternally. It's through the blood of Jesus that our sin is washed away. So, mark this hour. Mark this time. Remember the Lord. That's why He said, do this in remembrance of Me. Do this often in remembrance of Me. First thing that makes this night special, there was a sense of timing. It was framed by a sense of timing. Secondly, it was focused on a private gathering. It was focused on a private gathering. Jesus knew that the hour had come. Having loved His own who were in the world, He loved them to the end. Now, who's in the room with Him? Well, His own. Who are His own? Well, it's His disciples. It's the apostles. It's the twelve closest, those who would be regarded as His closest uh, friends, His his disciples. So, it's important for us to know that this isn't a public gathering. This isn't an evangelistic crusade. This is not Jesus giving a public public discourse or, or sermon. This is a private meal with those who are closest to Him, a close group of friends sharing food together behind closed doors. Think of the the, the general gathering his soldiers before they go out into battle to talk strategy, to talk about their plan, to go over their, their, battle, their battle plan. Think of a coach coming into his team and giving the, the rousing encouragement and, and going over their, their gameplay before they go out onto the field. Well, here's Jesus bringing his, his team in, bringing his soldiers in, training his disciples privately chapters 14, 15, 16, training them for what lies ahead, preparing them for what may come to pass. The question that came up in my mind was, why would Jesus, if He's about to leave the earth, He uh, he knows He's about to give His life, He knows He's about to die, why would He spend the last moments private with His disciples alone? They already know Him they're already saved, we would say. They believed in Him. They followed Him. They worked with Him. There's a whole crowd outside the the, the bounds of the walls in which He sits who don't know Him. There are many people who who are lost. Why wouldn't Jesus go out of that room and go out there and do some kind of miracle, Uh, do something that would bring as many people as possible in? Why wouldn't He go and give an altar call and get people down? It's a good question, isn't it? It's a searching question. There's a good answer, a good answer why he did that. The answer is that that's the job for the disciples. It's not his job. His job is to train them. His job is to equip them that they may go out and do the work of the evangelist, that they may go out and share the gospel, that they may go out and preach the truth. And that's an important distinction for us to make. At the very time that Jesus called His disciples, He said to some of them words along the lines of, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You're going to follow me for a few years, but I am going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to equip you to do what you need to do in order to be fishers of men. You're going to be the ones that will go and do that thing. You're the ones that will be equipped to go and do these things. And they became great at it, didn't they? through the teaching of the Master. Matthew 9, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. It would have been awesome to be there, would it not? When He saw the crowds, He had compassion on them. Such was His shepherd's heart, because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. Then He said to His disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask, the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send workers out into the harvest field. I would imagine that the disciples would have thought, well, that's a direct instruction from Jesus, right? Let's get together. Let's bow our heads. Let's unite our hearts. Let's pray about that. Let's pray for workers to be sent out into uh, the field, not knowing that their prayer was going to be answered. Jesus called His twelve disciples to Him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. And then He gives the names of the twelve apostles. 
And then what does it say in verse 5 of uh, Matthew? Uh, uh, in verse 5 then it says, these 12 Jesus sent out. Guys, we need workers. We need people to go, let's pray about that. I'm sending you. You are going. Your prayers have been answered. Get your shoes on. You are out of here. Now, here's the principle. We looked at it a wee bit on Wednesday evening when we looked at the gospel. You're saved, as we would call it. You come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. You put faith in, in Jesus. You become a Christian. You're born again, however you want to frame it. You're discipled. You're taught. You're nurtured in your faith. You, you come under the sound of the gospel. You invest yourself into the living Word of God. You grow in maturity and knowledge and understanding and wisdom, and then you're turned loose. You're saved. You're sanctified. You're sent. The, the gospel comes. The gospel convicts. The gospel converts. The gospel is then conveyed by the people who know it. That's why we're here. It's what the Lord has for each and every one of us. What makes this night so special? It's not just another Passover where they look back to the lamb that was slain thousands of years ago in an unknown country. This is the night that these disciples are going to eat a meal with Jesus before He goes to the cross, and Jesus is going to train them, and He's going to disciple them, and they don't even know how important this night is yet, but later on they will. Later on they will recognize just how monumental this encounter is. And that's just a reminder to us also that a, a normal day and an ordinary set of circumstances and things that we've done before may actually be hinge moments. They may actually turn out to be extraordinary realities within our lives. You remember the, the words of uh, Esther's uncle Mordecai? Uh, to her, his niece Esther was in the palace of the king. Remember his words? He says, and who knows, who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. This could be a very special moment, Esther. They didn't know, and we don't know. Moses wrote in Psalm 90, teach us to number our days aright that we might gain a heart of wisdom. The issue isn't uh, making time, isn't counting time, but it's making time count, isn't it? It's redeeming the time, as Paul uh, would put it. Guard your spare moments. They are like uncut diamonds, says Ralph Waldo Emerson. Discard them and their value will never be known. Improve them and they will become the brightest gems in a useful life. This night was special because it was framed by a sense of timing, because it focused on a private gathering. And the third reason is because it featured an act of service or serving. Verses 4 and 5, Jesus rose from the supper table, laid aside His garments, put a towel around Himself, and started to wash the feet of His disciples. Ever wondered about that? What's that all about? It's dinner time, surely. Well, here's the deal. 2,000 years ago in Israel, the weather was hot, a lot hotter than it is in Wester Ross, uh, a lot drier than it is in Wester Ross, and people didn't go around with wellies on, they went around with open-toed sandals on, so there was a lot of dust, a lot of, a lot of dirt, and just walking around, your feet would get particularly dirty, and so as a result of that, at the entrance to most homes, there would be a pot of water, and typically a servant who would be there to wash the feet of the guest who was arriving at the house. But we're told from the other gospel accounts that this was a room, a privately owned room that was lent, given to the disciples and Jesus for their Passover meal, but apparently it didn't come with a servant. And so Jesus assumes the role of the servant and begins to wash the feet of the disciples. Now, there's something else, and unless you know this, it doesn't make an awful lot of sense, but the clue is found in the Gospel of Luke. I'll just uh, read this clue to you. It's in, in chapter 2. Um, it seems that in the room that night, tension had been mounting. They were engaged in lively conversation across the dinner table. Then they began to argue among themselves as to who would be greatest in the coming kingdom. Oh, well, 
I'm going to be, I'm going to be some guy in the coming kingdom. I'm, you know, I'm, I've done great things, and I'm going to be afforded a position of authority, a position of significance. Oh, really? Well, I think you're mistaken because I'm going to be better than you, and I've done more things than you. And they're talking about that at the same time as Jesus is washing their feet. Quite a contrast, really, isn't it? The one with all power, the one with all authority, the one who created the heavens and the earth, the one who sustains them. He's washing their feet whilst they're arguing about how great they're going to be. How often are we the same? Who should have washed feet that night? Well, it shouldn't have been Jesus. It should have been the disciples, should it not? The servants. But none of them lifted a finger. And Jesus is washing their feet. What does it say? Having loved His own. Having loved His own. He loved them to the end. A better translation is literally, He showed them the full extent of His love. That's the introduction to Jesus washing their feet. He's given, been given all authority, all power by God. He knows where He came from. He knows to where He's going. Yet, He doesn't stand up and say, do you know who I am? I demand that you stop arguing. I command that you start helping out. Lift your, lift your head, lift your eyes, lift your hands, do something. Engage in something. No, He doesn't do that. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under His power and that He had come from God and was returning to God. And so, what does He do? He washes their feet. This isn't a job for the Messiah. This is a job for a servant, for a slave. And the disciples knew that. He did it for them. He didn't have to even challenge the words that they were speaking. Just by doing what He did would have convicted them. And everything that he does is predicated upon Jesus knowing who he is, knowing that Jesus had given, that the Lord had given him all power and all authority. And so he washes their feet. He's thinking about them. What's the principle? The principle is a powerful one. If you know who you are, you don't have to prove who you are to anyone else. Your identity informs your security. If you know who you are, you don't have to prove it. You don't have to assert it. Jesus knew what was ahead. He knew that there was suffering. He knew that there was death. He could easily have been consumed by himself and my problems and, and what lies ahead of me, but he knew who he was. He knew that he had all power and all authority. He knew He was from heaven. He knew that He had been in glory with the Father. He knew He was going back to the Father's side, and that enabled Him to freely love these bumbling, floundering, argumentative, bickering, nagging disciples. What can you think of in your life that would be described or considered as a menial task, something below your position? below your station. I'm not doing that. It's not my job. It's somebody else's job. I'm the manager. I'm the boss. I do this. Some of my, one of my minions will be here to do that. Let me ask another question alongside that. Who in your life can you think of that you find it hard to love, hard to serve, hard to forgive, Now consider that in light of what Jesus is doing here. When you're at peace in the Lord, you are secure in yourself, and you're free to love in the present. It frees you, it liberates you. Holding on to bitterness and being judgmental consumes you and embitters you. And thinking of yourself as greater than others well, it will only lead to division and disagreement. Jesus took off his outer garments, wrapped a towel around his waist, and washed their feet whilst they argued about who would be great. 
There's a fourth reason that this night is so special, uh, because it was filled with shades of meaning. It was filled with shades of meaning. He says he loved them to the end. He wanted to show them his love to the fullest extent. So here's my question. Is washing feet the full extent of Jesus' love for mankind? I don't think so. I mean, it's nice. It's a good example. And he's going to press it home. uh, And we'll see more of that next week, hopefully. But this isn't the full extent of his love. But he wants to show them the full extent of his love. He wants to love them to the end. What is the full extent of Jesus' love? The cross. The cross that lies ahead. The cross that he knows that he is going to. Not just that he's washing the dirt off their feet, but he's acting out a parable, uh, you could say, in in what is coming. He rose from the supper. He takes off his garments. He willingly got up. He voluntarily got up. He willingly took off his garments. What does that speak of? It speaks of him emptying himself, doesn't it? it? It chimes with Philippians 2 for me. He emptied himself. He poured himself out. He divested himself of his garments, of the glory that he came to the earth with. He wrapped a towel around his waist. Again, it's suggestive, isn't it? Jesus came, and though he was a a, a deity, though he was wrapped in divinity, he unwrapped himself from that and wrapped himself in the towel of humanity, God in human flesh, He poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him, pouring water into the basin. A few hours, he would pour out his blood. He poured water into a basin to wash their feet, and a few hours, he'll pour out his blood to cleanse their sin. And he's drying their feet with his towel. Why did John include that detail? Is that important? Is it significant? Well, I think it just points to the fact that when Jesus starts something, He completes it. He brings it to fulfillment. He does it all. The work that He began in you, He will complete. He will bring it to His completion, Paul reminds us in in Philippians. So, whatever He's doing, He will continue doing it until the job is done. But then, fifthly, very briefly, as we close, this night was fouled by sinful plotting fouled by sinful planning. Jesus is in the the room with His disciples, but the devil has come to dinner. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. What a contrast, isn't it? Here we've got Jesus, the sinless Lamb of God, Savior of the world, on his knees, washing the feet of his bickering disciples, an act of service in contrast to an act of selfishness. Here's Jesus, and here's Judas. Here's Jesus who thought of everybody but himself. Here's Judas who thought of nobody but himself. Here is Jesus whose motto was give. Here is Judas whose motto was take. They're shown side by side, and what a stark and arresting contrast there is between them. In effect, what you've got here in this verse is the difference between the devil's philosophy and Jesus' philosophy. How the devil and Judas do life versus how Jesus did life. Philippians 2, here's a a, a description of Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to His own advantage. Rather, He made Himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Compare that to Satan. Isaiah 14, how you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations, 
You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of the assembly. On the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the Most High. Do you see the difference between Jesus and the devil? Jesus says, I'm going to leave the glory of heaven and I'm going to go into the dust of humanity, and I'm going to serve. The devil says, I'm going up top. I'm going to be even greater than God. You are never more like Jesus than when you serve. Be encouraged by that. You are never more like Jesus than when you serve. And you are never more like Satan than when you refuse to serve and when you only want to be seen at the top. That's the power of the contrast that we've got here. What is Jesus saying? Use use your power to serve. Know who you are in Christ. Rest in your identity that's found in Jesus, not in who you are or in what you do or in what you've amassed or how good you are at this or at that. Not in how great you are, but rest in Jesus. Have your authority in Him and serve like Him, and you will know. You will know that you are impacting life, regardless of who we are, just like in an orchestra. As we were speaking with the children, you might be a mother, you might have authority over your children, you may be a husband or a father, you may have authority in the home, you might be a a manager, you might own your own company, you may have a position of authority or respect in, in the community. What if you were to use that position to serve, to serve like Jesus served, rather than lord it over people? It's a powerful example, isn't it? It's a powerful witness, it's a powerful testimony of God's grace in your life, but you can only do it if your identity is absolutely found in Christ. The composer Leonard Bernstein was once asked, what's the hardest instrument to play in an orchestra? And he said, without wavering, second fiddle, that's where we get the term second fiddle from, second fiddle is the hardest instrument to play because I can fiddle. I can get a first violinist all day long who will volunteer for the position. But for me to find somebody who will play second violin with as much enthusiasm, or second French horn, or second flautist, is very difficult. But you see, without the seconds, there is no harmony. It's a perfect picture, isn't it? Without the seconds, there is no harmony. Serve. Use your power, use your position to serve, and you'll be just like Jesus. Let's pray. God, our Father, we give thanks for Jesus, the one who had all power in the universe. We give thanks for Jesus, the one who knew what lay ahead of him and the horror that was approaching, and yet who was willing to stoop to his knee and to wash the feet of those who were boastful before him. Forgive us, Lord God, for our boastful hearts Forgive us for our judgmental spirit. Give us the heart of Jesus. May we be willing to serve as he served. And may it be a great testimony to the watching world, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. From them you came, helpless babe. Enter our world, your glory veiled, not to be served, but to serve, and give your life that we might live. This is our God, the servant king. He calls us now.
the servant king. There in the garden of tears, my heavy load he chose to bear. His heart with sorrow was torn. Yet not my will.